it's time for the big conversations telling stories of movers and shakers of industry giants and daring professionals it's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward if you don't know where these conversations are found we are sending you a gps but if you're listening to this voice right now you are here Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. All right, welcome to this week's edition of the Growth Podcast. So glad you could join us um, on today's edition of our conversations. Uh, we have a very special guest on the podcast this week. We're counting down to 100 episodes. Um, most likely at 100 we may quit, but for now we're giving it everything um, that we can. I know we're at 70 something at the moment. And uh, this conversation is going to be very, very um, informing uh, because my guest has got so much to unpack on the podcast. Um, my guest is from um, Nigeria. Uh, his name is Mr. Ayo Daniels. Uh, I was telling him that looks like a doctor. He says he's actually pursuing his doctorate. So something about me you know, <laughs> <laughs> that read uh, straight into you. How are you? I'm good. Good to be here. Good to good to have you. How is Nigeria? Uh, Nigeria is fine. Maybe I, I should greet you, uh, Muli Wanje. Ah, did you know? Uh, yeah, uh, Muli Wanje. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm happy appreciate to have you. Are you all like, that you do. Are you Yoruba or are you um, what's the Igbo? Oh, I'm Yoruba. Oh, Yoruba. So how do you say, how are you in Yoruba? Baoni. And how do you answer? Da, da, ni. Okay. Baoni means, how are you? And da, da means, I am good. I'm good. Yeah. Okay, good. At least I've learned yeah. something. <laughs> uh, we, we always like to start our conversations with cards. Okay. I've got uh, cards here. Uh, pick any four. Don't look at them. Just pick any four. Uh, when you pick the cards, you, you, you read the question and then you, you go straight and answer. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> All right. So just pick a card, read the question, and, and give, give me an answer. What do you know about life that few others have figured out, have figured out yet, or they haven't figured out, or what? Yeah, like what, 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 what do you know about life that others are yet to figure out? Well, maybe relationship. Relationship. Yes. I am keen on relationship. Um, I don't see a fellow human being as not somebody who is not worthy of anything. Every human being uh, deserves respect. Uh, they deserve to be had, and they deserve to be given a chance. Uh, so for me, I will never get to a point where I throw someone out. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next question. Describe an argument you have you had that helped shape the person you had today. Yes, that, that, that's a very interesting one. I, I used to work with someone uh, who liked to bully people around, and nobody wants to face him. Uh, so one day he came into the office and as the usual thing, and he just descended on him and I responded, and he walked away, and then he called me into his office later and he said, "What kind of confidence do I have?" Uh, he has never been challenged, and um, I thought he was going to fire me, but he just said that you are the kind of person I want to bring into my space. So uh, it was very liberating that day, and then for other people in the office, because it started up a new level of interpersonal relationship in the office. Okay, cool. Card number three. Describe an aya moment where you finally recognize how a past moment shaped you. I would say when I lost my mom, that was pretty about 10 years ago. Um, my mom, she, like an African mother, is always looking out. Uh, even when no one says hi to you, he places a call and say hi. Uh, he wants to find out how you are doing, how life is treating you. Uh, so uh, when she's no more here, I realized that life has to continue either way. So I have to face my giant in the room and then look for mentors as substitute to represent that in my life. All right, and the last one. As a child, what rules were made to be broken? Oh, <laughs> not being allowed to play football. It's a rule uh, where we were taught that you have to do your own work, do everything, do your house short, household shorts. And I always break that rule every time. So it's something that um, I get punishment, I get 
bullied, not bullied. I get uh, in my country, we use cane. So I get cane over and over again. And until you get to that moment where you know the consequences of these actions. So I just dare it each time I needed to be with my friends and play football. All right. Interesting. We're, we're done with the four questions. Um, we at least have gotten to know a bit about you. But overall, for those that may not know who Ayo Daniels is, who, who are you? Well, um, I consider myself as an introspective person. Um, I'm conscious about my thoughts, uh, about the things I want to see happen around my life and the environment sometimes. And usually, um, quiet, reserved, love to listen to music, and then love to spend time with myself. But over time, I realized that um, life is about relationship. Leadership is trust on me. And so I have to let go of that sometimes to be in other people's spaces. Um, and making that decision, I just want to see people grow. So it takes me out of myself and then spending my life on other people, I would say. Okay, for the most part, what are you, what are you known for? A family healthy, passionate person. Uh, I'm passionate about the family because I know that the family is the bedrock of every society. I want to see people grow. I want to see a good society. And uh, like Mother Teresa always say, if you want to change the world, go home for So that, that values that obtains within family, I want it shaping the whole larger society. Um, what else do you want to know about me? Um, I, I don't like to blow my horn, <laughs> but I like to go out for people. Okay. Um, I want to create an enabling environment where people can grow and be their best, deploy their potentials, and then pursue their dreams. All right. Are you, are you known for business and professionally? How, how do the circles recognize you? Okay. So um, I do a bit of um, uh, one-on-one counseling about family health. Um, okay. So I used to work in, a, in an office space. I realized that my colleagues in the office, they're always quick to burn out. Uh, so I used to talk to them, tease them. Then I started writing short articles, just like the card that you, you gave me this morning. Um, I, I give it to them as a word of encouragement for each day. And then I turned that into an article that went on uh, beyond the office. And I realized that it just kind of creates a very healthy environment in the office and all of that. So uh, I do a bit of business. I speak today to business people, young entrepreneurs, actually, uh, about not giving up about their lives, giving them hope, and then taking advantage of the opportunities that are banned around us today. Okay. What, what, what common problems have you seen young entrepreneurs facing in today's society? Wow. It's uh, number one problem that I've seen is they're not sure about what the future looks like. Uh, maybe in every country, I don't know about Zambia here, but where I live, uh, a lot of people, a lot of young people are confused. People love to read in my country, but there is nothing that suggests that they will get jobs after going through colleges or uni. Uh, so that's, that's looking at hope, looking at possibility. It's something that it's a problem. My country has 220 million people. And 70% uh, of that population are basically young people. Uh, people. And our median age is about 18 years. So between 18 and 35, they form the 70%. Um, a whole lot of immigration has happened in the last five years because people want to have better lives for themselves. But hey, the situation in the environment hasn't really permitted them. So, uh, the, that's that looking at the future as a bleak thing is one of the things that young people face. Even those who are running businesses, uh, the, the SME, the rules that guides that, is still a difficult terrain for many young people. Uh, but we are we are pushing it forward, and there are new things happening here and there that okay. predict the future for us. Okay, I think now we're living at a time where everybody is looking at young people for leadership. You know. Um, how do you think young people can prepare themselves for leadership? Either leadership in the, the corporate world, mm -hmm. others is leadership in their communities, mm -hmm. others is political leadership. Mm -hmm. How can young people be ready so that when the opportunity to lead comes, they don't throw it away? 
Well, I think the one thing we need to do is to get people involved. We have to be involved. Um, a lot of the times, my grandmother used to uh, give us a proverbs, a local proverbs. Uh, sorry for doing this. If I point at you now, there are four fingers pointing back up at me. And the simple lesson is that we must take responsibility. I think because of the the environment, a lot of people are giving up. They're giving up on leadership, the subject of leadership. Uh, they believe whatever the elderly people want to do, uh, let them do. Uh, it's so interesting that um, I was on event, series of events in, for some days here in Zambia. And when it was time to sing the national anthem, the response is, it was just like what is happening in my own country. People don't see their country anymore, giving them that hope and uh, for their dreams to be fulfilled. So I think involvement, and I think to a lot of a lot of the times now, apprenticeship is something that has been missing in our community. So I think if I know that I'm going to be a businessman, can I look for credible businessmen around me and then learn something in terms of mentorship, in terms of volunteering, that participation from them? If I want to be a politician, it's the same thing, and we can categorize them across the strata of the society like that. Okay. How 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 practical is mentorship? Um, it's one thing to say, find a mentor. How easy is it for, or how difficult is it for young people to identify with a mentor? Because also when I, I'm looking for a mentor, mm. how do I identify that, okay, this is the right one for me? That's a very, <laughs> that's a very challenging one. Um, everybody has that challenge. I did. Well, I'm still growing up in my, leader, with, with my leadership cushion. Uh, you ask yourself the question, are there icons in our society that we can really, because mentorship is beyond uh, just speaking a figure, maybe a celebrity figure. If you look at the history of mentorship, you know mentor is actually the name of a person. Uh, there was this guy who was going to war and he just handed over his son, Odyssey, to a mentor. A mentor is the name of a person. And he said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to war, I'm going to be absent. Everything you know, because I trusted you, everything you know, pour into my life. And history had it that I didn't come back until after 40 years, which his son, which he handed over to a mentor, has become a grown-up person. So finding that person is still a very good, it's a challenge in our society. But we have to, I say to young people, let's be intentional. There are people across our society, across our community, who still uphold certain values we want to see or we want to emulate, values of truth, integrity, honor, respect, service, so we can still find them. Even in the workspace, there are people in the office who are willing to pour into younger people. So how do you find them? Be intentional, then identify one. Uh, if you see one, you will definitely see. You guys are here. You're working here. So I, I believe if someone is interning here, without even saying, I want you to be my mentor, if he sees the way you work, the work ethics here, it should be, that person should be prepared to take you on as a mentor because you are inspiring many people for the future of Zambia. And some people may be lucky enough to actually find the, a good mentor. Yeah. But you find that they sort of abuse the relationship or yeah. they don't draw as much value yeah. as they should yeah. from that mentor-mentee relationship. Yeah. When I come to you um, as a mentor, what do you expect from me as a mentee? Okay. Number one, hungry. You should be hungry for knowledge. A mentor is not, a lot of the time when people have people as mentors, uh, they are looking for, there's one disease that is common among young people these days, is a disease of entitlement mentality. Uh, if I have you as my mentor, uh, if you ask me, I won't ask you for money because I don't need the money. What I need, I, a mentor is someone who has been to where I want to be. So what I need, I need you to share my knowledge. You may have been in this industry, for example, for 30 years. I want to learn. I, I, want, I, want, um, I want to learn from you. I want, um, how do I say this? I won't invade your space. I respect your time. I respect uh, the access that I have with you. I won't abuse it in any way. Uh, every minute spent, in fact, most of the times, why people, young people miss it on this mentorship is that they are quick to say words. 
your mentor, I don't have to impress you. You are my mentor. You're my teacher. I'm emulating you. So most of the time, I will listen to you. And back to what you asked, bad mentors, yes. Being, you find people uh, who's their bad character, we actually shape a strength of uh, resilience in you. Um, I said to people, if you have never been used anywhere in the workplace, then you are not ready for leadership. So a lot of people run from all these things. So I will not abuse the privilege of access that I have with you if you have to be my mentor. I won't ask you for money. I will just go after your knowledge and I will be so hungry enough to go. I will go the extra mile to be able to learn and if everything I need to learn from you so that I can keep the relationship for a long time to come. Can you expand more on the statement, if you've never been used in the workplace, you're not ready for leadership? Well, you, you will agree with me this morning that you've worked somewhere before. Were you satisfied with the working conditions? Probably no. So being used doesn't, is not in that de detrimental form, but being stretched in capacity, being stretched in character. I mean, if I work in a place, there is a test of character, a test of integrity. Um, I understand the work culture in that place, and I adjust myself. And the day I know that it doesn't feel fit into who I want to be, I probably leave. So that test of character is there. That's being used is there. I, I probably work, and my salary, my remuneration is not in, in comparable to the amount of work that I put in. But because I know that this is going to help me to achieve my own goal in life, so I'm ready to be used in that context. So it's a positive thing, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you know that you're being like sidelined for leadership in the workplace? Well, it, um, a lot of the time, people talk about that. Uh, being sidelined is a question of if, if I'm in a place, and my presence is not known. I don't get involved. I can't work in a place, for example, I mean, what my work experience, I can't do a nine to five. I don't know how to do it. Uh, the boss wants us to put in extra time. I'm ready to put it in without being paid. That's part of being used that I mentioned earlier on. So uh, if I'm a kind of employee that picks my bag at 5 p.m., if you have project at hand, and I'm not willing to push in extra hours, uh, I, may not, I may not be considered for leadership in such a, a space. Okay. What, what, what are some, some of the core values you think I must have for every young leader? Truth. Integrity. Honesty, resilience, diligence. You know, these are things that individual must be intentional to cultivate them. Integrity is who I am when no one is watching. Integrity is who I am consistently all true. So if you ask me in the morning about a particular thing, I say the same thing. In the afternoon, I say the same thing. In the evening, I say the same thing. So I'm consistent. If I'm running a project, I'm consistent about it. I, I don't blame people. So I, I think people should just be intentional, take responsibility for their lives, and then take responsibility for, for the things that have been committed into their hands. Okay. There are sometimes, and, and I'll take you back to the workplace, where... At individual level, I feel I am ready for the next level of leadership. Yeah. But those around me feel I am not. Yeah. You know, what usually causes that disparity? Where I feel like I am ready and they feel like I am not. And as a result of that, there's this now frustration boiling in because I feel like I'm not appreciated, I'm not valued. What do you think mostly causes that? Everybody feels that they are ready. That's the truth. But not, you see, we are seated here this morning. I can't see my back but you can see it very clearly. You can tell me if there is anything behind me that is going to um, maybe injure me and you are quick to correct me. So in the workplace, um, I, I said to people, do you, do you regularly ask your colleagues? I mean, it's a very difficult thing to do, getting feedback to actually know, what do you think about me? What is my work culture like? How? Uh, at the end of the day, maybe at the end of a quarter, an appraiser is done. But usually, even at, even at appraiser, people get upset. So a lot of the time, people feel they are ready. 
but their supervisors, their line managers, people who oversee them, they can still see some cracks, some things that they know that they are good. They know they are brilliant, they are intelligent, but there are things that still must be polished. You know, iron sharpens iron so that you can get it. So there are things that must be polished out of me. I may have ego. Ego is also not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. That's the drive the creator puts in everyone to wanting to accomplish much with our lives. But the way I go about it, I may have fault in how I communicate my ideas, and people can see it as being unnecessarily proud. People can see me as looking down at other people that I'm not a team player. Player. So those are the things uh, that if I think I'm ready, uh, because thinking that I'm ready has nothing to even do with my qualification. There are smart people out there now who are not even uh, pursuing knowledge within the four wall of, of uh, classroom, but they are good. Uh, they are alive to their environment. They can communicate very well. They are good team player. Uh, they, they, they can see through every project, they are not tired. So such people will probably get accelerated promotion than somebody who just sit back somewhere and feeling that is qualified for leadership. Okay, and you mentioned um, something about feedback. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard for it people is. to have honest conversations yeah. and say, look, I think you're slacking here, your performance is not what it should be. Yeah. And most of the time you find that instead of having the hard conversations, mm -hmm. people end up sugarcoating things. Yeah. Like, I know you're not doing very well, yeah. but you find that maybe we have a friendship. I don't want to hurt that. Some people do not respond to yeah. feedback. Yeah. We want to be told what we want to hear, the nice yeah. things. You're doing very well. You're, that we take. Yeah. But to be told, if you continue on this path, you, you may have to be let yeah. go. No one wants to have those hard conversations. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think it's a cultural thing. You know, as Africans, we live in communities. So uh, because we live in communities, we are brother's keeper. We don't want to hurt each other. So sometimes some of those conversations are just sentimental conversations. Uh, sentimental in the sense that you know that this person is not performing well, like you said, but you are not ready to help the person to grow because that's the way I see it. Um, if you correct me, uh, I do a kind of introspection to say, okay, this is what the boss said, or this is what my colleague said, am I actually? You know, there are uh, two levels of relationship that we have, the one we have with ourselves, which we call intra-relationship, and then with the one we have with other people, which is interpersonal relationship. So if, because African culture says, uh, don't be seen as the one who is, um, who is limiting the progress of other people. So a lot of people keep quiet. And the one who speaks out are regarded as being uh, brash in their approach to things. But I think people must just learn to take feedback. They say feedback is a breakfast of champions. How do you learn to take feedback? I do something very good. Like after this program, I'm going to ask you, what's your impression about me? And if you tell me the honest impression, that would tell me whether I'm coming back here or not again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, even as married people, the best person who can give you a feedback is your spouse. It's your spouse. I mean, as the boss here, uh, people here may not be willing to, but you take the initiative by asking them, hey guys, we out of non-official half time half, how are we doing? What do you think about me? Or do like, I do it a lot, anonymous feedback form, let everybody just fill in to tell me who, who am I? How am I doing? And then even in the workspace, what can we do better? Because I mean, as a leader, everything rises and falls on leadership. So every aspiring leader must learn to take feedback. Okay. And talking about leadership, um, much is women's day around the world. Yeah. Um, and yet we have very few women who are actually taking up leadership positions. Yeah. Um, from your experience, where have you seen the bottlenecks? What are the challenges that stand in the way of women taking up these leadership positions, either it be in the workplace, um, in um, business, or even in, in the political realm? Okay, so I, I think you, you, you probably agree with me. Here in Zambia, I think it's between 13 to 15% 
of women that are ministers and all people in, in, the, in, in the parliament. I, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's not much. Uh, but I, I still think what I said earlier on is the easy thing. It's a cultural thing. Uh, women generally in Africa are regarded as homemakers to make kids and to keep the homes. But the narrative, I don't know if you notice it, in the last 15, 20 years, is changing. Women are seen to be able to manage businesses better than men, husbands. That's the truth. Uh, in the global space, they are taking on species gradually in, the, in, the, in, the, in corporations, in the workspace. So I think the narrative is changing. Uh, and I think because of the initial narrative that says women are supposed to be home, the men are supposed to be go out there, but we have better things with our women this day. They are becoming learning. They are becoming good managers of resources, more, much more than men, and that's the truth. I, I, I say this in conversation that if my wife is the CEO of a bank, She's my wife. I must be secure enough to accommodate that. So I think the cultural narrative has to also change. Uh, we have to accept it. It's a hard truth. Women, are, I'm not a feminist, but that's the reality if you interact with people. Women manage things better. And so that's where we are. And the future of Africa, uh, because in, I mean, women are taking on professional roles as pilots, as um, tech people, as engineers and all that, some of those roles that were leader to men before now. So I think we will we will see growth in that area. And the only thing we can do for our women is to encourage them that beyond being the homemakers, they should also learn to deploy their potentials as professionals, as career people, and as business owners. Where do you think the insecurity comes from um, with men who have women in their lives or like as a spouse? who hold very powerful positions. You mentioned if your wife is CEO of a bank or maybe is mm. minister in government or yeah. is a governor. Yeah. Most men seem to, you know, be insecure because they feel that a man should have, you know, the upper hand in any, you know, relationship of that yeah. nature. And yeah. so you find when the woman rises, it sort of like then begins to create cracks in the marriage. Yeah. You know, wh where do you think that comes from and how do you think men can better address it? Well, interestingly, you see that cultural thing. We all grew up in, in, in this African society, in my own country, in my family. Men are even not considered to go to the kitchen to do any domestic chore. That's how it is. So we all grew up as to what the role of a man should be and the role of a woman should be. Uh, I, I have a junior brother and I have three elderly sisters. When we were growing up, we were not permitted to go into the kitchen to even do the common chores. So it's like a cultural thing. But I have to learn because I, I was living on my own before I got married. So I have to learn that. And I think that thing, that cultural thing, also came with insecurity. There was a phase in my life that my wife was handing about three times over. And I'm, I'm sure that here you find out that some women also hand more than their men. You probably would not know because men in such position have also developed themselves. They are not lazy, but it's just what I would consider as time and chance. So, and I think where we are, everyone must admit to that. It's a reality. If you find, if anyone finds himself or in that space, he should just accept it. My wife is Mrs. Daniels. If she hands money more than me, doesn't really matter. It's for the well-being of our family. But I think the cultural mindset is that a man, in my own country, you hear things like the source of the word of a man, you must not reveal it to the woman so that the woman will not use it against you. So you have all this cultural mindset that people carry along, which also leads when they put it in the family context and they are not ready to change. Some people experience violence in their marriages as a result of the woman honing more stuff than a man. But if there is that mutual understanding, and then we are building together as a team, one family team, I don't think it should be any problem as we navigate sharing our lives into the future. Another thing about leadership, um, you touched a bit on it, is the subject of education. Yeah. Some people think that because they have amassed higher levels of education, mm -hmm. that is tantamount to them Mm. automatically mm. qualifying 
for a next tier in leadership. Mm. You find in the workplace, for example, a young man gets a diploma, gets a degree. Mm. When they get a master's, they feel that I cannot still be here because mm. I, I must now make manager, I must be mm. head of a department, mm. I must be a director or mm. something like that. Mm. And if it doesn't come, you find that they begin to sort of have this attitude toward work because they feel I am at a place where I am not deserving of this. I deserve more than what I'm having. And so they feel that those who are lowly qualified are the ones that should be under them. Yeah. So what is the word education? It's a Latin word, educo, which means ability to induce solution from within. So I can go to a former school, I can hold a master's, I can hold a PhD. When there are problems on the table, am I able to bring forth solution from my frame of reference? If the answer is no, then I'm not qualified for leadership. What makes me a leader is, my, is what I know, how I apply the things that I know. So if the former education is not going to help provide, bring solution and add value to what I'm doing, I probably am not qualified for leadership. So um, education is good. It enhances our potential, no doubt about it. It helps us to have this wide frame of reference. Uh, when there is a problem, we can easily bring forth solution. But if that is not, and leadership is service. Maybe I should say that. Um, so no matter my education, I should still be able to serve. So if it's in a workspace and there are no spaces, but I should be able to deliver value such that irrespective of what I think I merit or not, if I'm bringing solution, it's a matter of time promotion will come. That's my perspective towards that. Okay, I, I came across um, a thought uh, from someone on social media and they were saying that there's a difference between school um, and education and then they also added knowledge and they say they did not see the point in one going the formal route of education mm -hmm. where I go get a degree for four years, then I go and do another master's mm -hmm. when I can learn the same things or even more relevant things mm -hmm. on social media, for example, on YouTube or things like that. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what's your thoughts on that? Uh, people who think that I can learn these things, like, for example, um, business management. I can watch videos on YouTube, you know, I mass knowledge. I can listen to Elon Musk. I can see Bill Gates talk. Yeah. I can listen to Motsepe and they'll yeah. give me the insights I need. I don't need to go and do business administration yeah. and be taught by a lecturer who's never run a business himself. Yeah. So um, I, I read a couple of things like that. Some people even say education is a scam, but I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I, I, think, um, I think people should learn uh, I think so. I believe so. People should learn. People should give themselves to knowledge. And then people should also, beyond a degree, um, people should give themselves to continuous self-development and learning. And that's where uh, all these things on the internet comes in. Um, for my education, I'm hope for it. In for my education, I'm also hope for it. I think such people are just talking from the line of thought of apprenticeship, uh, which is something that has gone out of the windows in, in our African communities. So I think if it's that sense that they are talking apprenticeship, able to learn something new on YouTube and all that, it's okay, but that former education is also not is a scam. I don't believe so. So both, whether former or informal, is what we needed, or is what we need for the future of our continent. So, uh, so some people will go to that former school. Some people will go to technical college. Um, I, I saw something here this morning. I'm not sure whether you are you went to school for it. Um, you are able to put cable, you are able to identify what is happening um, with the machine here in the studio. So, hey, you, you, you probably don't learn that in school, but by reason of what you do at the moment, you are able to learn such things. You don't have to call in the technical person each time. So those are informal education. Every leader should be a learner. That's the key, whether formal or informal education. Okay, how do you think that communities can, can, can help to play a more active role? in nurturing leadership. Um, and by communities, I mean, obviously the communities where we, 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 we associate with. Yeah. Um, also broader communities, for example, in the workplace, yeah. for example, how do they nurture leadership? Because there are two kinds of people. There are those that see 
that okay here is a rising star and yeah. they want to shut down yeah. that person yeah. because they look at them as a threat yeah. and then there are those who say ah look there's a young person here let's train them let's upskill them let's help them you know on their on, on on their way up how can we nurture young leaders okay so before before i i just contribute into that there, there's something that they found out about crabs um crabs uh if you have a big bowl on this table and you put about 200 crabs um, and you go for two, three days, if you come back, you won't find any on the floor. Why? Uh, crab, by, I don't know, understand, I mean, studying in, if, some, if one crab is trying to climb out, uh, there's just that pull down. So there are people in the workspace, in our community, in our families, they don't recognize value. And so because they don't recognize value, they don't know how to give it. I said something earlier on, if I have issues with my intra-relationship, I will have issues with my interpersonal. If I'm not kind to myself, there's no way I can be kind to people. If I'm not honest with myself, there's probably no way I can be honest with people. So in the because we live community, whether it's at work, whether it's in our, our families, um, there will always be the need for leadership. And I think what we need to advocate for or begin to do as individuals, because leadership begins with us. So if, I, if you say to me now, I hope leadership begins with me. How I lead myself will inform how I'm going to position myself to lead other people. So I think people should just accept that this leadership thing, every society is looking for leaders. Every workspace is looking for leader. And what are the things that they're looking for? Someone who takes the initiative, someone who enables others, not who kill on the, down on the potential of other people. So because we are looking at that, everyone should position themselves to become leader. And we cannot be too much. I know that there are philosophical thoughts that say uh, one singular person is a leader and every other person are born to follow. I disagree with that. There's an element of leadership in that everyone. If it's put in the right environment, it grows. Uh, let, me, let me just end that with the story of the shark. If you pick up a shark um, in its little element, and you put it in an aquarium. Maybe the aquarium is at the size of this table, and then you put it there for four years. The aquarium, the shark will not grow beyond that aquarium. You pick the same aquarium, and then you put it back to the right environment. Within six weeks, it grows half to the full length of what it's supposed to do within those five years, four years. So it's very important. Everyone who is a line manager, who is a, a, a CEO manager, who is a chief, who is, who is a leader in the community, a leader in the family, must realize that leadership has fallen on them and their primary responsibility is to lead and then bring up uh, the leadership quality in other people. Okay. And also from your experience, looking at young leaders, what, what are the notable mistakes you've seen young leaders make on their way to the, to the top? People are not resilient. They are not patient. Uh, people these days are highly mobile. So I have seen people who say, this week, this person is my mentor. And then next week, for whatever reason, they say, no, it's no more my mentor, it's this other person. So they are not consistent. They are not intentional. Uh, so I, I think there are traps out there. It, just like in every other area of life, there are traps. Everyone uh, should, every leadership journey should begin with a vision. What, what is vision? Vision is foresight based on insight with the benefit of hindsight. So who am I? What do I want to do with my life? Um, who fits into this figure? Uh, how do I begin my journey? I know people who started with vision, who says one day they will be the MD of a multi-corporation uh, organization. And they started as interns and they were able to, I mean, developing themselves all through. So they were resilient all through their leadership journey. And it, with record times, years, they became that. There was not, it was a good ambition. They set out from the onset. Some took them, some it took them 15, 20 years. So leadership is a journey. So I think every 
aspiring leader, growing leader, should, uh, as much as we have the vision, should also know the things that must be. They are like traps. They are like mines on the journey of leadership. Impatience is one of them. Dishonesty is one of them. Uh, association that doesn't have value in that context is another thing. So every aspiring leader should watch out for those minds feed and then be consistent. Like I said, everything begins with a vision. See that vision as the hand of that leadership journey and then take that journey and then uh, do a check on themselves. I mean, one of the things about leadership is that if I say I'm leading and no one is following, then I'm just taking a stroll. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm big on, on accountability. Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to hold others accountable. Yeah. You're not doing this. You should be doing that. You said you would. But to hold oneself accountable is a challenge for many people. Yeah. How do I develop self-accountability? Okay. So th this is, um, maybe I, I should put it this way. If in life, uh, we have three levels of relationship. A lot of people also don't know. Um, relationship that you have with people who have gone ahead of you. Relationship that you have with people who are your peers. Relationship that you have. Um, with the people who are upcoming. So if you see yourself as that middle person, uh, accountability becomes very easy. If I go into, into hero as I'm sitting here now, if, I, if there is anything that is happening to me, there are people who can face me, just like we're facing each other this morning, who can say, boy, what have you done? How, what happened? How did this happen? And they are ready to wrap their hands around me uh, to see me get out of that situation. And there are people who are coming, who are wondering, ah, why did it happen? So for me, accountability is this, because I have to explain to people who are ahead of me, I have to explain to people who are my contemporary, and I have to explain to people who I'm inspiring. Uh, it holds me in check. Uh, Self-discipline, we, we cannot compromise it in leadership. Everybody wants something for themselves, but we must be able to define what we need and what we want by time. Have you ever faced a challenge with self-accountability? Yes. I, I, won't, I won't lie to you. Vulnerability is one of, of the mark of true leadership. I, I, I've been moments that I've been down. There are moments I've missed it. I've, I've messed up. But hey, you know, it, it, it's here, it's in Africa. That's one of the beautiful things about our African culture. If I have a child and my child is trying to walk, and in the bit to try to walk, he falls down several times, I won't take him and say, oh, I don't want him to hurt himself, and then strap him 24-7 behind my back. If I do that, I'm going to affect, it's going to affect his life. So, hey, uh, leaders, this is, and that's why accountability is very important. So that as we take our leadership journey, if there are things that are missing, somebody must be able to tell you. If something is behind me, you, I'm sure you are a leader, you will tell me, be careful. Somebody must be able. So I need to also hold myself accountable that I am not just responsible to myself. I'm responsible to the people who have gone ahead. I'm responsible to my contemporary and I'm responsible to the ones who are looking up to me to point to them. In a country like Nigeria, you mentioned 220 million people. Yeah. How do I stand out as a leader? Well, how do you stand out? You ask yourself the question. I'm different. What do I need to stand out? Hey, simple things they use for biometry. My fingertips is different from every other human being. In fact, that one is 6.7 billion people in our world. So my thumbprint, the shape of my hair, my iris, and I'm just different. So that consciousness that you are different, what am I supposed to be doing here? When I mean here, on the heart. I am not a liability. I'm not a parasite. I have gifts. I have talent. So when I do that self-appraiser, it will inform the kind of education I want to expose my mind to. It will inform the kind of vocation that I want to take. It will inform so many things. So my life, whether we realize it or not, even though we are 6.7 billion, if that is the right um, statistic at the moment, 
everyone is unique. Everyone has something to contribute. It's very easy to see uh, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, but I have, I can nurture my own grass, I can cultivate it, I can make it lush for all the people to also see. I mean, here, someone has something to do with music, someone has something to do with making furniture, making microphone, making the phone, making the water. So everyone has something uh, to contribute, but it's very easy to look at other people's gifts and be envious of it and covet it for ourselves and then neglect ours uh, to, to the detriment of the society. There's something that is called in our world, the brainchild. Someone made this microphone, so it's their brainchild. Someone made my shirt, someone made the button. So that consciousness that I also have something to contribute, I think is going to distinguish anyone across the nations of the world. Another issue is on on, on continuous self improvement. Improvement, yeah. Um, how do I continuously check up on myself and see where am I lacking? To be obsessed with, am I doing better? Yeah. Am I doing better? Am I doing better? How do I achieve some substantial continuous improvement at yeah. individual level? Because why I'm saying myself, like you said, it's easier to see what's on the other side. Yeah. It's easier for me to see where you should improve and yeah. where you can make progress. Yeah. But to see in yourself, yeah. to be honest with yourself and say, look, I think here, I have to keep improving. I think self-awareness. A lot of people are blind to their environment. So self-awareness, that's number one thing. Um, if I'm aware that I can't do everything, if I'm aware that there are spaces in my life that I need to synergize or collaborate with other people. So I will focus on what is important. I will harness my potentials to the area that it will benefit and add value and I can contribute. So that, that self-improvement, it's something. I mean, there's a saying in my country that says the day you graduate from school, that's the end from, to learning. Well, but that's not. You and I have fun. That's self-awareness. Um, we take us to being alive to our environment. There are things these days that tech can help us to, to, to do. Uh, I mean, there used to be all those big cameras. Look at the ones we have in the studio this morning, as little as they may look like. So there is always need for self-improvement. And that self-awareness will need, lead me to being alive to my environment and then utilize things that can help me save time, money, energy, and put my energy into productive things. So I, I think that's that's the thing. The day we stop, all stop learning, that's the day we start dying because we become obsolete and we are not relevant to our society again. When you reflect on, on your journey, um, what, what do you look back on and say, I, I think I should have done this differently in terms yeah. of leadership, in terms of yourself as a person? Yeah. Um, uh, maybe the, the things I, I put my energy on, in terms of educational pursuit, if I knew that this is what I'll be doing with my life today and probably to the rest of my life, I would have started early. But I had no regrets. Wherever you started is the right place. And you know a Chinese proverb says the journey of a thousand years begins with a step in the right direction. So today you take that right step. So I have many things uh, that looks like regret, but I don't dwell on that. Uh, one thing I do, I learn from it, but I also use them as raw material to create the future for my life. Okay. If you were to give five pieces of advice to young people today on leadership, what would you say to them? Five things. Develop a resilient spirit. Serve others. Be devoted to your vision. Love your country. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a greater one. And then be willing to point to other people while you're on your way to, aspire, to fulfilling your own objective. There is no, a lot of people wait until the retirement before they do certain things. But as you climb your leadership ladder, also learn to pour into other people. Thank you, Mr. Daniels. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been a, a, a very informative conversation. I think the, the whole aspect of leadership, we just see it in terms of the, the titles and the perks that it comes with. Yeah. But there's a whole that goes, you know, yeah. beyond it yeah. that, that we do not uh, get to see. And also I appreciate your thought on, on self-awareness. 
I think most people just, you know, are not very alive to their environment. Yeah. And so you find that you think you're responding to something when what you're responding to is not even there. They're even reacting, not responding. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people are not proactive. They okay. just react to things. But hey, you should have seen it coming and then you should have take the precautions and probably prepare oneself better to face the challenges. Okay, so those that would like to learn more from you, how can they get in touch? Where, where can they find you? Are you on social media? Are you? Yeah, it's just my name, Ayo Daniels. Uh, you can look it up in, in Instagram, X, uh, Facebook. I don't do much of Facebook. Yeah, I, so I, saw, the doubt, <laughs> I saw the doubt in your body language is like Facebook. I don't do much of Facebook, but I do all the things that um, any young people will do today. Uh, you probably find me there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much for, for the time and uh, we wish you all the best as you as you travel back to, to Nigeria. Thank Any you. idea when you'll be back in Zambia? Ah, uh, if you <laughs> ask me to come <laughs> next week, I'll come back. But, has this been your first time? No, no, no. This is my fifth time. Oh, I okay. come practically every year oh, in the last you, five years. Then you come again next week. Yes, I will. <laughs> but if you want me back next week, hey, no, no, no I will. Problem. No, I will no, back. You've been a good guest. Thank you so much for sharing the time. Now, totally. Am uh -huh. I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I told you I mean thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys. All right, cheers. Yeah.